Hey, Facebook, Elizabeth Nader back with you, Jersey First TV. I am so excited tonight and honored to have with us Republican Congressman Madison Cawthorn from North Carolina. Welcome to Jersey First TV. Elizabeth, it's great to be on with you. You know, I have been hearing about the great work that's going on in New Jersey, really with a groundswell of people who are realizing that uh, yeah. this whole socialist agenda, this democratic agenda is one that's trying to limit their freedoms. And that's not what America's founded on. No, that's right. And you are known as a champion of freedom. That's why we reached out to you because you inspire so many people. I was telling you before we went live, so many people in New Jersey supported you. You probably didn't even realize it. I got messages all day once we started promoting this that, wait a minute, I supported him. I wrote him a check. So I want you to know that I think, you know, the borders of the states don't matter anymore. We care that you are fighting for us. And I want to talk tonight about a lot of the things you're working so hard on because we really, really appreciate it. But just for everybody, this is the youngest sitting congressman right here, which is so incredibly cool. But you're not only that, you're a business owner. Uh, and so you understand small business, which is great. And you just got married. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. That's my favorite accomplishment as of my life. As it should be. And that leads me to my first question. As you look at building a family and you look at all of this, t tell us what your why is. Why did you run? Because this is no small thing. This is not easy. You get hit a lot. It's a lot of work to do this. You're putting yourself and your family out there. Why did you run for Congress? Well, you know what? The reason we got involved, uh, you know, Christine and I, I, as soon as I got engaged to her, really the seat opened up a few days later. And we talked about it and we realized that we didn't want to raise a family in a culture that is so divided, so vitriolic, so aggressive, so just, just toxic. Yeah. And that's not what I believe our country is. You know, we should be one united America where we don't say, are you a Democrat or a Republican? You just, we, we're connected as Americans who all agree on the same subset of values. Right. Uh, I, I really champion myself as a values candidate, not so much as a Republican or a Democrat. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm here to, con to pursue conservative principles that are good for everybody. Yeah. And so getting involved at this age is obviously very unorthodox. But, you know, I, I was afraid that there would not be an America left if I waited until I was in my 50s. Oh, gosh, isn't that the truth? In fact, I think a lot of us feel like everything that's happened this past year, that 2022 is sort of you know, our last chance here to start to really turn things around. So we're going to talk about that at the end. But, you know, I've been watching you closely and Congressman, I mean, you're doing a lot of great work and you are getting attacked like crazy, which is always a signal. One of my favorite quotes, and I've heard you say it, Winston Churchill, right? This says, if you have enemies, right, I'll paraphrase, you yeah. must be doing something good. What has that been like for you to be the 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 attack? You know, they've been attacking you, the fake news, the the spin, the stuff that's coming out uh, anytime you do anything. How has that been for you as a new congressman? Well, you know what? I knew what I was getting involved with. Uh, I, I think a lot of Americans are waking up to realize that the news media is extraordinarily biased. And yeah. I don't even say mainstream media anymore because they are anything but mainstream. And I believe 80% of Americans agree on the overwhelming amount of issues. But because of the mainstream media, uh, they always just try and focus on what separates us, what kills us. And so I, I don't even believe that they're mainstream whatsoever. But yeah. when the news media is attacking me, when people in Washington, D.C. Are, are coming at me left and right, but then I fly home to Western North Carolina in the mountains uh, and people start coming up and shaking my hand. Old, older people are crying, hugging me, saying, thank you for fighting for the future of my grandchildren. That gives me all the encouragement in the world, because if I am hated in Washington, D.C. and by these people who are the enemies of liberty, but I'm loved in normal America, then I know I'm doing my job. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in any case, there aren't that many platforms left anyway that are positive. I mean, we, we invited you on here. What we're trying to do is bring that positive message, right, to support American values. But there aren't that many places that you can go right now that you will be accurately uh, described, right? Your work that you will be uh, interviewed in, in a fair situation. So we need to step up our game, don't you think, and provide more platforms and more outlets? That, tell that is absolutely right. You know, I am just encouraging the, the, the good, good hearted Americans across this country who love freedom, who love liberty, mm -hmm. start using that beautiful mind that God has given you, the creativity that we have, the imagination that we have, the can do it attitude that our side is so known for, the optimistic attitude and use that to create a country that you can be proud of where your voice can be heard and represented. 
Absolutely. Now, listen, in Jersey, we I don't know how much you see us in the news. We've got a tough situation here, Congressman. We've got a governor who is really a king right now. He's still he's still signing himself emergency orders. I think he's on month 14 now um, and the emergency powers. So we're in a difficult situation. And I know that you recently sent a letter with your colleagues to the CDC about opening schools. One of the things Jersey First is fighting for and we've been helping actually lawsuits um, to open our schools. Our kids are hurting. I want you to talk about that issue because I know there are issues with that also in North Carolina. Where have you stood on that? Well, the place I stand on it is that we should not force a zip code to determine the future of a young man or a young young woman. Uh, you know, these children that are growing up in our country are the next generation. That's why I'm so proud to be on the education committee. Uh, yeah. Because one, I'm trying to reform our higher education, which I believe has just turned into really these leftist indoctrination camps. Uh, it's not even liberalism that they're preaching. It's it's really just just socialistic agendas, okay. um, and so. But also, it's starting to creep into our K through twelve. And so, I think that we need to open up more school choice. Uh, you know, I was actually homeschooled all the way through uh, K through twelve, and I believe that was probably one of the greatest gifts my parents ever gave me, yeah. uh, because you know I, I was able to understand a lot of the real truths in the world and not have to deal with all this leftist indoctrination, and then have to come home and say, Mom and Dad, what is true and what's not? I was just told nothing but the truth. Right. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about this. And it's because, you know, I, I believe that we shouldn't be p politicizing our children. You know, I think there was a uh, um, the, the leader of the Third Reich, actually, I believe, once said that uh, if you give me the next generation, then I will give you the future. And, yeah. you know, obviously he was talking about it, give me the school systems and I will I, I will take charge of this country for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, and, that, you know, that that's exactly what I think that the leftists are starting to see. I think they're starting to believe that they can take control of the future if they take the minds of our children. And so that's why I'm fighting so hard for school choice. Yeah, I believe that, too. And school choice is such an important issue. But right now our schools aren't even open. I mean, in, in New Jersey, not all of them are open. And we've that's got awful. kids who are, they're regressing, Congressman. They're regressing young kids who no longer want to get on Zoom, who can't deal with it. Parents who have had to quit a job to stay home and they don't have school choice. So their only choice, unless they're going to homeschool, is to deal with this. So and I, I don't know when you guys wrote that letter to the CDC saying, listen, inconsistent, we need to get the schools open. Where is the science, Congressman? What is the science that they're using to make these determinations? None of us seem to know. It's a moving target. How frustrating is this? Oh, it's extraordinarily frustrating. The people, the person that the America is really forced to look to is Dr. Anthony Fauci. Right. You know, so one thing that I think would be probably one of the most entertaining uh, debates that could ever be televised is Dr. Fauci in March of 2020 debating Dr. Fauci in March 2021. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just the inconsistency is so totally. frustrating for Americans. Yeah. The, the, the goalposts are always moving. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think it's just this this it's this this cult of control, and this cult of power. They have realized, oh, if I use fear, if I use COVID, then I can I can have my way with these people. Uh, yeah. And it's very, very sad. And so I'm starting to see a lot of Americans across the country starting to reject this anti-science, this anti-common sense uh, narrative that the left is pushing. And I think that's very encouraging. But it, but, you know, what? these children have no choice. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they don't have a voice. And yeah. so as long as we bend the knee and capitulate to these tyrants. You know, the more it hurts our next generation. Yeah. And I saw that you made a comment about H.R. 1319, which um, it's funny. I, I interviewed Robbie Starbuck Monday night and he talked about how the left named their bills. Right. Like save the puppies. But and, we, and it's really not that. Right. It's really not what they say. So 1319, of course, was this bill about saving America. But the truth is very small amount of money went to Americans and the money that did go to the schools, there was no there was no clause to say open. We're going to give you this money. Open your schools, and so we don't we don't have any of that as a big stick, even to force them to do the right thing. You know, you're absolutely right, and that's something that I think the left is doing so well. They've learned to pull on the heartstrings of Americans, yeah. and you know what? That's what we tried to emulate inside of our campaign: is that not only are we going to bring a logical message that actually does good but one that's packaged in a way that actually makes people feel good. And right. so I think if we can learn to message this empathetic version of conservatism, we will win for the next decade. And then we'll, the Democrats will rue the day they ever started overstepping the bounds of the Constitution. Yeah, empathetic conservatism. I like that. But also civil liberties. Wasn't that the left's issue for so long? Now we're the ones 
who are fighting for that. And a good example is this threat of the vaccine passport. Now we've had a lot of different reactions to that. We've got DeSantis in Florida saying, absolutely not. We've got New York embracing it. And I'm sure New Jersey will follow suit. Um, where do you stand on this? Because you know, from, from a Jersey first standpoint, we're very concerned about the government overreach. And I don't even see how this plays out with each state doing something different. So where are you on this, Congressman? Uh, where I am on it is that, yes, it's bad to, to say that we want to violate people's HIPAA, HIPAA rights and say that we want to violate the Fourth Amendment. And remember, if you read the Fourth Amendment, it does not expressly state that you have a right to privacy. But if you look at the original intent of the authors of the Constitution, you can t you can see that when the Fourth Amendment was drafted, it was very clear that you have a human right to privacy. Right. And so when these people are forcing you to say, hey, you know what, we want to be able to look into your private personal medical files, you know, that that's that that's the first step to eugenics, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, as, as bad as it is to have a vaccine passport, I believe that this is actually the, the least bad version of what this could be. Because if we develop this blockchain technology using software systems that are going to be required for these vaccine passports, they can then be opened up for all kinds of things. That's and right. so then it can start saying that you are going to have like you in, in the communist China, where you have a social ranking that That's says, right. are you a good person? Or are you a bad person? How many good deeds did you do? But obviously, these are all extraordinarily subjective. And what is good is determined by the, uh, the big state who wants big brother, who wants to have nothing but control. And then it's going to start being able to control what you're able to say, what you're able to do, where you're able to go. And it's really, if you want to be able to use this vaccine passport to be able to go out and, and buy and trade and, and participate in commerce and travel, that's the mark of the beast. I mean, it, it, it's a terrible way, road that we're starting to walk down. It's amazing that we're so close to it. And, and I think a lot of us uh, a year ago when they were removing exemption rights state by state and we saw the force of pharma doing that, we were sort of shouting out, hey guys, this is a step towards this. Little did we know that COVID was coming. And so here we are. How did we become the party that's shouting for choice? You know, that word that the other side used to use, my body, my choice. We're the ones now saying, how do you as an American get told that you must, you must. Now, if you want it, you take it. But if you must put something in your veins, I'm amazed that we've gotten to this point. How does the left package that? It's for the greater good. It's to keep everyone safe. Indeed, well, you, you, you started to hear it. And it, it's just, it's, it's full on propaganda where they're saying, you're not doing this for yourself. You're doing this to prove that you care about other people. And so, you know, you can be on a Delta Airlines flight and start listening to what they're saying on the air. You know, yeah. wear your mask to protect yourself and to show that you care about protecting others. Mm -hmm. And when really I'm saying, you know, if the mask works so well, then why do you need me to wear mine? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I've got so many problems with the mask mandate, so many problems with the vaccine passports. But you know what? It's, it's more the left uh, just saying do, uh, do rules for thee, not for me. And it's just right. it's, it's it's really it's tyranny. And this yeah. is what we fought against in 1776, is having a ruling yeah. class that's being able, able to tell us what to do, but they don't have to live by the same rules and mandates. Yeah, and here we are, and, and here we are again. So let let's let's shift to an issue that Jersey First also is passionate about, and that's veterans. So it just so happens that you also serve on that committee, which is awesome. And I see that you've been doing a lot of work on this. So I want you to take some time to highlight what you're doing and advocating for veterans because there's several several different bills that you're involved in. Can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of things that we're working on. You know, the thing that I'm probably the most passionate about is allowing veterans to be able to use their GI bill, bill that they put their lives on the line for that they went out and earned and not only use that to be able to uh, have educate money for a higher education, but also be able to use that for a small business loans because you know, mm -hmm. I, I genuinely believe that we need less lawyers in this country. We need more people who work with their hands more people who own their own business. And I think it's what makes America powerful. I think it's what makes our economy powerful. Right. Um, and so I'm very excited for that. But, you know, in all honesty, uh, this is a country that, you know, we politicians all the time, we go on victory laps in our, in our district all the time, just meeting with veterans saying, I vow to support these veterans. Well, now it's our time to actually put our money where our mouth is and support our veterans. Right. These people deserve the thanks of a grateful nation. If they don't start getting it, then, you know, I'm going to start crying that from the rooftops because right. these young men and women put their lives on the line for us and they should be taken care of for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when we are starting to let in so many people, starting to give illegal immigrants stimulus checks, starting to say, we're going to guarantee you a job. We're going to give you a higher education. We're going to uh, we're going to pay for you to have legal uh, uh, legal 
representation whenever you need it because that's just what we do and you're not even a legal immigrant you were not born here and you didn't go through the proper channels to get into this country when we start saying that we're going to do that i scratch my head and say aren't there five hundred thousand uh, veterans who are currently out of work many of right. whom are homeless right and are having to live on the side of the road until they are all taken taken care of until we've taken care of america first i don't want to start thinking about the rest of the country rest of the world Absolutely. And so that obviously brings us to the border issue. So before we get to that, though, I want to thank you for fighting on behalf of the veterans, because I believe you're making a big difference there. And a lot of people um, just feel that no one's paying attention. And I think Trump tried to do that. And obviously now we need more advocates like you. So thank you for, for doing that. We have a show on the veterans next week. So it's really near and dear to our heart. But let's talk about the border, because there you go. You hit it right, the nail on the head. We're letting everybody in. And, and, and thank you, President Biden, for finally admitting there's a crisis at the border. Bye. Finally, right? I don't know what took him so long, um, but we're letting them in and yet we can't take care of our own. So you guys worked on a, a special bill about the border. So I want to get into this and dig into this. Tell us what you're doing. So right now we have, uh, we're obviously pushing a lot of initiatives that are just working to actually be able to secure our border and to finish and complete the border wall, the gaps that still exist and to give more funding to our, uh, the CPB officers and our border patrol officers. Uh, but, you know, what I genuinely believe is the, the, the first step in doing that is to make sure that we don't lose the progress that we already have. Right. Uh, and so if the Democrats want to play a game of technicalities and of semantics, I'm willing to play that game, too. And I'll beat them at it. Yeah. Uh, and so what we have recently introduced is the Donument Act. So I think Daniel, Donald and Monument put together. Uh, and what that really is, is that it creates a national monument out of the already existing mo multiple hundred miles of border wall, which then would refrain and keep the, the liberal left from yeah. ever being able to tear that down or to start re us regressing in the other direction from where Donald Trump's already gotten us. So it's called a Donument. The Donument Act. Yes, indeed. <laughs> that is so creative. I love it. Did you tell President Trump about that? I've got a call with him coming up next week, and I'm telling him then. I should think that he would absolutely love to hear that. So yes, the document will protect what's there. How do we get the rest of it finished? Uh, the question is, how do we get the rest of it finished? Well, you know what? The, the steps to do that is to get these bastards out of office. Yeah. Uh, so step one of being able to complete that, you know, my team and I, we went to our personal state legislature uh, and worked on election integrity bills there. They're, they're moving ahead in the right direction. I'm very thankful for that. But now we're shopping those ideas to other states all around the country and the 39 yeah. Republican state legislatures around the country to make sure that we have election integrity. Once we have that piece fixed up, then come next November or November 2022, I can give you my word. We will take the uh, we will take the majority back from these Love dogs. It. We will then be able to actually work and move forward uh, and get this border wall finished. Now, will President Biden ever sign that? I'm not sure. Right. Uh, but if we if we if we're extraordinarily successful, I believe we might even have a majority to bypass him. Yeah, that's awesome. OK, so you brought up election integrity, which is always the elephant in the corner, because, you know, everybody says, why are we working so hard? We get to the polls and it's all it's it's cooked already. Right. So tell us specifically what you've been focusing on in that arena in North Carolina. Yes, indeed. So what we're doing is one, we're making sure that they can never have this uh, this uh, this this illegal and unconstitutional means of collecting ballots ever again. Right. Uh, the reason it was so difficult to prove um, the election fraud in a way that would hold up in court, even though I think we could have if the Supreme Court would have heard the case. Right. Uh, but the reason why it was so difficult for us to just have, oh, well, here's a one pager on it. And this is what the reason why it is is because we had an unconstitutional means of collecting ballots, which That's means, right. you know, it goes around Article 1 of our Constitution, uh, where they start uh, starting to create election laws and the means by which elections are carried out in certain states. Right. Uh, when they started circumventing the state legislatures, and then you have, you know, Secretary of State, like down in, or, uh, down in Georgia, or uh, boards of elections in different states, like in Wisconsin, who just completely circumvent these board of elections, yeah. our, our state legislatures, and then basically they have a unlimited ballot harvesting. They got rid of the signature verification. And then in a lot of these states, they shred the evidence. And so then yeah. there was no way to be able to prove this. Yeah. So one is to make sure that we, they are un, never able to actually bypass our state legislatures again. Right. Uh, next step is going to be requiring more uh, signature verification. And then let's start just getting very common sense. If we just like, explain it like you no would common to a fifth sense. grader. Yeah. <laughs> Have an ID to go vote. How is no. that racist? It doesn't make any sense. No. To you. you have to show an ID to buy a beer. 
<laughs> but you're telling me that it's impossible to sh- for people to show an ID to actually go and exercise our most powerful right that we possess in this country. It- it's country. absolutely ridiculous to me. And so, one, I think we should have extraordinarily limited mail-in balloting, uh, really for our people yeah. who are either in the uh, in, in inpatient facilities in the hospital right. or, or who are deployed overseas and for military for the military. Um, aside from that, you should have to show up in person, show your ID, and vote that way. Um, yeah, really, I feel like that would that would fix all the problems. Yeah, it's just common sense. So it almost feels ridiculous that we have to lay that out. Like, isn't that obvious? And at the same time, while we're, while we're saying this, HR1 is looking to sort of codify all the fraud into law, right? So it's one thing that we're trying to say, hey, guys, common sense, use a driver's license. It's insulting yeah. to tell people they can't get a license or in some kind of ID. Come on, don't insult people. They Absolutely. can get one. All these common sense things that would help us keep elections fair, and you would think it would be bipartisan. At the same time, you've got HR1. So HR1 passed the House. It doesn't, I mean, we're praying that with the filibuster and everything, it doesn't go through the Senate. What do you think is going to happen with HR1? That's pretty scary, Congressman. You know what? I believe that hopefully this West Virginian Democratic senator is going to be able to hold up and hold hold the line. Uh, you know, he's part yeah. of those JFK Democrats, the people who yeah. would sit down and say, okay, you want a little bit higher taxes, I want Absolutely. a little bit lower taxes, whatever, let's go, let's go skeet shooting. Yeah, uh, but not like the socialists we have in Congress today. And so uh, we're not dealing with JFK Democrats, but I think he is actually one of those JFK Democrats um, just based on when he was born. And so I think yeah. he's, he's an old school blue dog Democrat. So hoping he holds the line. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if they if they do overtake the filibuster, you know, what, that is going to be very dark days for our country. We're going to have to really have a gut check with ourselves and determine where we're going to draw the line in the sand. The scary thing about it is if it does, uh, then it goes. We know Biden signs it. And really, at that point, it's a Supreme Court fight. And I got to tell you, after we trust the Supreme Court. Exactly. Yeah, I I, I used to think, oh, don't worry. They'll protect us because it's so clearly unconstitutional. But we fought so hard for Amy Coney Barrett. We fought so hard for Justice Kavanaugh. Yeah. And when it really counted, I feel I feel like they let us down. Really, really disappointing. And you bring up such an interesting point, which is the change in the Democratic Party. You know, it's this, you're right, the JFK, the Kennedy Democrats. So I, I, I'm wondering, now that you've been in and you've seen what's happened, we all kind of wonder about the soft Dems who are more of a JFK type Democrat. When they get into Congress, is there some sort of pressure that Pelosi is putting on them? Are they signing some sort of blood oath? What's going on? I don't know if there's some kind of ritual, a lot of little <laughs> candles around where they are signing, <laughs> signing these blood oaths. But I will tell you, Nancy Pelosi is a force unto herself. You know, yeah. we can all sit here and act like she's how ridiculous she is and how asinine her policies are. But she is probably the most powerful Speaker of the House there ever has been. Sure. Because she rules with an iron fist. And sure, she rules by fear. It's not the way I would ever want to lead. But she yeah. does it so efficiently yeah. that we have never seen a single Democrat break with the other Democrats. But I genuinely believe if we get this election integrity taken care of in all these 39 states, that will be what they are truly regret. Because a lot of these Democrats who are in difficult districts will then have to say, yeah. I voted with Nancy Pelosi, Socialist Pelosi, every single time. And then you'll say, I thought you went to represent us and they'll lose their election. That has to count. So so we need to hold them to that. And and I and I think you're right. That will work in our favor. So it brings me to the obvious question of term limits. I mean, you're right. She has been one of the most powerful. She never seems to go away. She's more ubiquitous than anybody we have. So what are we doing about term limits? Is that ever going to happen? I am working extraordinarily hard to get some really true patriots elected because, you know, whether it's Mitch McConnell, whether it's Nancy Pelosi, they've been in office longer than I've been alive. <laughs> I mean, and if good. you can't get something done in the first decade, maybe 12 years, and I don't want you representing me. Yeah. Now, I don't want you to only go up and serve four years. I want you to be able to get your feet wet, learn how the system works, get your job done, and then right. go back to your district, raise your family, start, go back to your business or retire, do whatever makes you happy. Right. But I don't think, I, I think there are enough good hearted, red blooded Americans in this country that we never have to worry about having good people to fill those seats. Yeah, I agree with you. And it doesn't seem like the intent of the founders was was to have people in power for this long. It really wasn't meant to be a career. Would you agree with that? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I think really to speak to that point, I mean, just look at the life expectancy rates in, 17, in the 1780s when they were so working true. on this. Yeah. Uh, you know, they probably never expected that somebody could serve for 25 years in Congress. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so genuinely, what I genuinely believe we need is we're going to need to pass a term limits package. Now, unfortunately, we're probably going to have to 
uh, have some people grandfathered in because very yeah. few of these people will ever vote for themselves out of this. Uh, <laughs> but then, you, you know, I, I'm sure that there'll be enough political pressure at that time to get them out anyways. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I'm hoping before I leave Congress that I get rid of the federal income tax and okay. get term limits on Congress. Those are my two major number one goals. Well, hallelujah. Where, where can I donate? I mean, that's awesome. We love that. We love that. You're speaking our language. Let's talk about something else you're passionate about. And uh, I got to tell you, I loved, it was a short speech you made on the floor, but it was fabulous and replayed and replayed. And that's the second amendment. And I'm, I'm sure I'm going to read your words back to you, which is this. First, you said, if we lose the second amendment, the first will fall. Absolutely. And then you said, Mr. Speaker, you want my guns. I know it. We all know it. Mr. Speaker, you can come and take them. So uh, obviously you're passionate about the second amendment. Tell us how you feel about it. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I genuinely believe that is what safeguards all of our rights. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of tragedies that come with uh, with there being so many firearms in our country. But, I, right. um, you know, I think that those tragedies are less severe than the tragedy of absolute tyranny and genocide would be. And right. I believe that, uh, that you know, I, I would choose a dangerous freedom over safe subjugation any day. Oh, wow. And I think the overwhelming amount of, of Americans would. And so that is why I am. I, I will never give up my guns. Um, I, I think that almost any gun law is an infringement on our rights. I think that yeah. you know people need to be more well equipped. Um, and really, you know, there's a reason. I, I know up in New Jersey, or if you're down in Miami, or if you're in New, New York, everyone always talks about how dangerous the drivers are there and how aggressive they are and everything. That doesn't happen in the South because everyone knows you have a gun. There's a whole <laughs> lot more polite society when that happens. Is that the reason? So, and, and, you know, that, that's a funny analogy. But, you know, yeah. I think if we take this to be more serious, that's yeah. why I'm so against gun-free zones. Uh, yeah. These sick and twisted, vile people who go shoot up schools or shoot up, uh, you know, a club in Miami, um, they are normally almost always cowards. You look at these people, they're pencil-necked cowards. Yeah, that's um, true. And, and that's they true. would never stand up to someone who could shoot back at them. And yeah. so that's why I think we need to get rid of gun-free zones. I think we need to enact permitless carry in every single state, constitutional yeah. carry. Yeah. Um, and I think we need to, you know, make, we need to, uh, you know, obviously be able to make sure that we, I, I, I'm okay with background checks. Um, as soon as long as it's absolutely instant, I don't want felons to get guns. I don't want right, people of course not. in the country to get guns. Of course um, not. But you know what? But I think we need to make it very easy for Americans to access firearms. Yeah, absolutely. Agree with you too. That's awesome. Let's shift to what happened in my uh, home state of Minnesota. Uh, that's where I'm originally from, and uh, a lot of a lot of tough a lot of tough scenes there. But um, your colleague Maxine Waters, um, this has been quite quite an experience watching her on TV. We thought it was bad enough with Trump, but she was there this weekend, uh, really stirring it up. And of course, you guys uh, voted on the censure; it didn't pass. Um, I guess no surprise party lines. How do you feel about what she's doing and what she's saying? Well, I call her kerosene Maxine. You know, you, you really needed to call the, uh, the the jurors in that case and say, yeah. hey, I need you to, to just just not pay attention to Maxine Waters. She literally pours kerosene on top literally. of her and says, we will burn you if you ever do not vote the way we want you to. Um, yeah. And you know what? I, I, if you watch that video, I, I don't have all the details on that story. If you watch that video, you, you, who knows what the case, the verdict needed to be. Uh, right. I, I, I trust our ju judicial system when it comes right. to criminal charges and our local justices. Um, and so that our judicial system needed to come up with a verdict, and they did. Yes. But right. right now, because of what Maxine Waters and President Biden said, I genuinely believe that there's going to be a very strong case in, in appeals for this because, you yeah. know, who knows how much that that those jurors were tainted in that election because they, you know, they were basically literally threatened. Hey, if you vote, if you, if you vote in, in, the, in your jury trial to, to say that this person is acquitted, then what you're going to do is you will, you 12 will personally be responsible for the city's burning and the blood in your streets. I mean, how can you ask a normal person to have to make that decision? I don't know. It's so out of control. And I'm amazed. I mean, the Democrats close ranks like I've never seen before. The Republicans would never do that. If somebody spoke like that, you would be out. I mean, look what happened on January 6th. And they went after, wanted to censure people for what appeared to be support of what appeared to be this or that. And, uh, you know, the Republicans threw their own under the bus. But the Dems close ranks on something that is so, this could it's be a because, so, Not to cut you off, but this is something yeah, that okay. just infuriates me. Because I know. so many people in our party are just so so cowardly. And yes. that is why we need term limits. That is why we need people who are going to stand up to the to yes. the status quo in Washington, D.C. But, you know, that's why I'm very happy. You know, guys like Kevin McCarthy and Steve Scalise. You know, Steve Scalise took, valiantly took that bullet from that radical yep. who came to shoot up Republicans. Um, and then his security guards took the man down. 
Um, and, and then you have, you have Kevin McCarthy, who now is saying, who very boldly said, stood up and told, I, I literally watched him in person, tell Nancy Pelosi, if you don't act, I will. And then he tried yeah. to censure Maxine, uh, uh, yeah. Maxine Waters. Right. And you know what? Unfortunately, we were not successful in censuring her. But right. as I was said, said earlier, as long as we get election integrity sorted out, it will make these yeah. Democrats in difficult to win seats are very, very open to attack. And so I think yeah. it will help us take back the majority. That's and what we need to do. Elizabeth, I hate to have to cut, cut it short, but I've got to go speak It's 30 on minutes. Floor. You got to go. Thank You're you, good. Congressman. We appreciate you so much. We'll have you on again. All right, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Talk Bye. to you soon. Bye-bye.